All right, hello everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm John Howard, I'm a senior architect at Solid.io, uh, and I've been a contributor at Eastio for, I don't know, about six years now maybe. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you guys about Life of a Packet Ambient Edition. We're going to walk you through uh, how traffic flows through the entire system when you're using Ambient Service Mesh. Uh, and we kind of aim this talk at both beginners who have never heard of Ambient Mesh, um, get a little introduction to Ambient Mesh, as well as people who maybe are familiar, who have tried it out, or have used Istio in the past in the sidecar mode to kind of compare the differences and hopefully learn something new about how the system works. And I'm Keith. I'm a senior engineering lead at Microsoft. I've been working on Istio for uh, about two, two and a half years. And I'm going to kick us off uh, with, the, with the talk. So this is an overview we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with the high-level architecture, just so you can figure out where everything sits topologically in, a, uh, in an ambient mesh. Uh, we're gonna, then we're going to talk through how the outbound traffic is going to get to the Z-Tonal proxy, uh, break down all the different pieces that are required in order to make that happen. We're going to do some load balancing stuff. We're going to talk through uh, how Z-Tonal picks a destination um, and how all of that works. Uh, we're going to talk about the protocol. Uh, we call it H-Bone. Um, that's going to give us a, the ability to do a lot of the things that we're able to do in Ambient. We're going to break down for you exactly how that works. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about uh, plain text traffic uh, and how that can coincide with HBone. And finally, waypoint proxies for layer 7 bits, uh, which if you're doing uh, HTTP-related things, you're going to need to be able to deploy that. So we're going to walk through all of this. It's a lot to get through. Uh, if we have time at the end, we've got a mic there in the center for questions, uh, or you can stop us in the hallway track if you have something specific you'd like to discuss. Okay. So let's start with, like I said, a high-level architecture uh, to help you understand where everything sits. So here you've got a diagram of a client and a server who are trying to talk to each other. And in Ambient Mesh, what we've got is a two-proxy model, uh, the first of which being a Z-Tunnel. Z-Tunnel is a, um, in open source, it's a Rust node proxy that will transparently upgrade your traffic to MTLS. So you see here the client is uh, going to have traffic redirect it to the Z-Tunnel. And then the Z tunnel is going to send traffic to a destination pod or a destination service. And that traffic is also going to get um, redirected to a Z tunnel which, and then forwarded on to a server. So this is kind of like a packet level view of where the traffic flows from the client to the first Z tunnel, then to the second Z tunnel, then to the server. We also have waypoint proxies for when you have uh, any layer seven capabilities that you need. Maybe you need to have a JWT integration with Auth0. Maybe you are needing to uh, do routing based on headers or things of that nature. For those sorts of things in the two proxy uh, ambient architecture, you're gonna deploy a waypoint proxy. Waypoint proxies serve basically as cluster internal gateways. So when you call a service, the waypoint sits in front of that service and handles that layer seven policy or traffic manipulation. As you see here in the diagram, the Z tunnels live on the node while the waypoint proxy lives in the namespace. And those waypoint proxies can be auto scaled, they can be uh, deployed in whatever way that you, that you would like. And so, in this example, the client sends traffic to the Z tunnel, and then that Z tunnel is going to send traffic to the waypoint, uh, which then will forward traffic at the end to the server. So this is sort of a full picture of what a kind of production level uh, deployment of an ambient mesh is going to look like. You're running in Kubernetes, you're going to have a gateway at the very beginning for traffic ingresses into your cluster. Uh, this is all, by the way, all the uh, Istio logo there, that's representing uh, Istio D, the Istio control plane. That's doing all the programming, all these proxies. So that Istio D in the Istio system namespace, you see we've got actually namespaces listed out here. That SCOD is going to be programming that gateway as well as the waypoints and the tunnels. So like I said, you've got traffic coming in from that gateway. Uh, that traffic is going to be forwarded to either Z-tunnels or waypoints um, as uh, the packet flows through the system. And again, this is all being managed by Istio. And Istio can take care of the uh, encryption, the security, the observability, and the traffic policy that you know and love um, all from a central system. So now that we've got kind of this very, very high level overview, we're going to actually take a kind of life of a packet through just a single request from a client application to a server and explain how things function throughout the system. Um, so our journey starts really just with a simple client pod running in a cluster. And maybe this sends a curl request to another application. Here I used Hello World service, right? 
Now, if we're just using standard Kubernetes networking, we would expect that to leave the pod and go through some system of Kubernetes networking and eventually end up on a Hello World pod. We're not going to get into the, de the details of how Kubernetes networking works. We're going to talk about what we do differently. Uh, but there's a lot of talks on other places about how that works. Now, what we expect, based on what Keith said, uh, to happen with Istio involved is now, instead of directly leaving the pod, this is going to go through the Z tunnel, right? And so we want something more like this. Uh, now, you'll notice that there's something weird here. We said Z tunnel was this one per node daemon set running uh, on the node, right? But here I've shown Z tunnel inside of the application pod. I will get into that a bit later. Uh, for now, just accept it. Um, so how do we get the traffic there, right? Um, depending on your familiarity with Istio or IP tables, it's somewhere between dark magic and <laughs> very basic IP tables commands. But ultimately, what we have is just a few simple-ish rules. Uh, if you don't speak IP tables, this basically says, for all traffic, leaving the pod, uh, ignore part of it, redirect it to port 15001. And so we open up on ZTunnel a port 15001 that's going to accept that traffic. And then IP tables is able to just redirect that traffic to us. We accept it. Uh, very, very similar to the sidecar model, if you're familiar with that. Now, you may wonder, how, how does that happen? How do we actually get those IP tables set up in the pod for this to even happen in the first place? Like, we skipped a few steps here. Uh, to look at that, we need to understand how a pod is actually created in Kubernetes. So a super simple view of a pod creation is we create a pod, and then we create the containers, and then it's off to the races and running application stuff, right? But fortunately, Kubernetes has this thing called the CNI, Container Network Interface, which lets us inject logic in between these two steps so that we can set up the pod to do networking things. Um, and they have kind of this series of plugins which you often run many different plugins in parallel to fully set up the pod. Um, so this can be things like setting up the IP address, actually allocating an IP address to the pod, setting up devices in the pods, routes to them, like actually setting up the virtual Ethernet devices, et cetera. Uh, more custom stuff like bandwidth control type things. Uh, and an Istio plugin is what we have, which allows us to get invoked and set up the pod before the user's applications are actually started. So what this looks like is we have kind of on a node, uh, you know, we have the Istio CNI plugin, uh, the application pod, and then the Z tunnel. So the first step is the container runtime is actually going to invoke our plugin for us when the pod needs to be created and give us some information about you know, the, the name of the pod, things like that. And we're able to actually enter into the pod network namespace and set up these IP table rules. Uh, if you're wondering, like, how can you just enter a pod and configure the pod, that seems crazy. Uh, I do have a talk on Friday where I go a lot more into these namespaces uh, called Testing Kubernetes Without Kubernetes, if you want to learn more. Um, for now, just take my word for it that there is a command that lets you enter into a pod and uh, configure the network. Um, so after we set up the IP tables rules, we notify the local Z tunnel and say, hey, there's a new pod. And that allows it to also enter the namespace and set up sockets. Now, this is really like the single key uh, point to how ambient mode works in general, and it's often very, very surprising to people uh, when we explain this. Um, so, like, if we look at the logical view, like from pods or from like actual compute or binaries running, ambient mesh looks like this, right? There's one Z tunnel per node, like we said, and a bunch of applications. But if we look at the networking view, it really looks something more like this, just like the sidecar model. Each application kind of has, logically, its own Z tunnel running, right? There's actual sockets on each pod inside of the pod network namespace that are unique to those, that specific pod. And while those happen to be backed by a single Z tunnel pod, uh, really, if you didn't know what was going on, it looks exactly the same from a networking point of view as a sidecar. Um, and so there's kind of this difference between the, what the kind of logical view is, the networking view, and the compute view, right? <coughs> Um, so one cool thing about this as well is that while uh, we get some of the same behaviors that we want out of sidecars, uh, that like everything's happening inside of the pod, by the time it leaves the pod, it's fully encrypted and ready to go, uh, we're not so tied to the life cycle of the pod. So one of the issues we saw with sidecars in the past is that if you want to upgrade the sidecar, you have to restart it. If you want to add a sidecar, you have to restart your workload. If you want to remove it, you have to restart it. With this model, things are a lot more dynamic. So we can actually add or remove or upgrade Z tunnel from a running pod 
uh, totally dynamically, which has been a huge uh, benefit for operations we've seen. Uh, I'll hand it over to Keith now to show us what happens once the packet actually gets to ZTunnel, how it decides what to do next. Yeah, absolutely. So once ZTunnel gets requests, and remember, like John said on that previous slide, each pod actually sort of has a ZTunnel instance in the network running, uh, running inside of it. So when that instance gets a request, we already know where the traffic is coming from, right? Any proxy has to figure out when where the traffic come from and where, it's, it's going, where, where is it going. And that first part of that's already done for us because of the architecture of ZTunnel. Um, the original destination, as far as the uh, service IP address that you originally were sending traffic to, we can get that with classic Linux original destination socket options. We can be able to recover that and use that for our routing. Um, one thing that we want to emphasize here is that ZTunnel is a layer four proxy only. So the only thing that it has access to is the uh, five tuple, pretty much. Um, it can't parse HTTP host names, or TLS server names, or anything like that. Um, and so while a lot of what goes on in ZTunnel seems like magic, we're just using classic Linux uh, TCP uh, functionality. Um, Basically, once all that is, is done, what comes out of the tunnel is uh, the destination that we know that we want to route to. And when we say magic, it's not really magic, right? Like I said, this is all classic Linux networking things and classic proxy architecture. And so there's just configuration that the SEOD sends to the tunnel pods that helps it understand where it's route traffic to. This is a view of what ZTunnel sees uh, when it comes to all of the services um, that are eligible to be routed to. And then here's another um, example of configuration for all the workloads. Um, you can do these yourself. These commands aren't some dark magic only SEO maintainers have access to. This is built into the SEO CTL CLI that you can go and you can download today and be able to observe what ZTunnel sees. Um, so when ZTunnel gets a request and goes through the process that John just described in getting the traffic redirected to it, it does a simple matching process against all of the services and workloads in its config registry. Um, if the request uh, gets matched to a particular pod, we send to a specific workload, and that's going to be kind of on that right side, right? Uh, workloads correspond to specific pods. You see the full pod name uh, there with all the random stuff at the end. That is what we call a workload in ZTunnel. If the request is to a service, which is the more common use case, you typically send to a service cluster IP, um, then we'll find all the endpoints of that service and send to one. And that's key based off of the service virtual IP address there in that first picture. The default right now is sort of basically random selection, uh, but there are options for more advanced load balancing techniques. Uh, for example, you can use uh, the service topology uh, routing features to be able to say prefer endpoints that are close to me for some value of close. It could be the same uh, AZ, same region, et cetera. Uh, if, we don't route, if we don't match anything, as we talked about workloads, talked about services, if we look through all those and we see nothing, then we'll just pass the request through directly. Once that client ZTunnel has picked a destination, we then use that information as far as what destination we're sending to for a variety of things. Um, telemetry uh, that is emitted in that client ZTunnel um, report, uh, for all that reporting. We uh, use that information to know what sort of mutual TLS to expect from uh, the sender. Um, that's a place where we enforce policy where we say, uh, I expect that the service that I'm talking to via this virtual IP has this certificate. And that's how we prevent man in the middle attacks. Uh, and that brings us to our next topic, mutual TLS, right? So when we send the request, we don't actually open, like proxy the request through directly. Most proxies take requests, look at it, reassemble it, and then send it back out. But we don't do that in ZTunnel. What we do is we open a tunnel uh, using HTTP connect. Uh, who in here has had to deal with WebSockets in the past? Raise your hand. Yeah, a good bit of you, right? HTTP Connect is what powers the WebSocket protocol, but it's so much more than just WebSockets, right? Connect is a way for establishing a tunnel and then sending really arbitrary traffic through that tunnel. And so the inner connection that you see here, you see the destination pod with port 8080, that's within, that's the original connection that we're sending within HTTP Connect. And on the outside, what we're sending is an HTTP uh, 2 tunnel with MTLS enabled. So that tunnel 
uh, is where the certificate's gonna live, this is what's gonna uh, take care of like, verifying the server, uh, it's gonna be on the outside of that tunnel. Uh, one of the neat tricks about this, because you're using HTTP2 connect, is we're able to put multiple connections into a single MTLS, uh, single MTLS HTTP2 um, stream, for lack of a better term. Uh, and so this helps us to reduce the number of MTLS handshakes. If I am sending MTLS five times to five different, um, or just five times, then I've got to do TLS handshakes five different times, and that can get expensive. With Connect, we do that once. We're able to do HTTP2 multiplexing in order to uh, sort of amortize the cost of those handshakes. Nice. Um, this gives us a lot of important flexibility um, that are gonna come up later when we talk about waypoint proxies and how you're able to amortize the cost there. Uh, yeah, so going back to the flow of traffic, one thing you might be wondering is, well, we had a rule that said all the traffic goes to Z-Tunnel. Uh, but Z-Tunnel is inside of the pod. So how do we make sure that we don't end up with this terrible scenario where Z-Tunnel sends the traffic and it goes right back to itself over and over again infinitely, right? That would be quite bad. Um, so this comes is where the, uh, this is where that mark comes in that I told you to ignore earlier. Uh, what this basically says is that if there's a mark on the connection, then ignore this rule. Um, and so a mark is something that we're able to add on a connection. This is like a Linux networking thing. Uh, where you can just say this packet has this mark and then you can do whatever you want with that mark. In this case, we... <laughs> In this case, we use that to exclude, uh, to not have a loop. Um, so you may be wondering as well, like, ah, oh, that sounds great, I'm gonna now bypass the tunnel because I noticed that this magic mark and you showed me right here, it's uh, X539. Uh, Fortunately, setting this mark requires elevated privileges, net admin, um, and so typically an application wouldn't be allowed that privilege. Um, Z-Tunnel itself does have this privilege. That's how it's able to do things like enter these network namespaces, configure the networking, all these different things. And so it kind of has a special access that application typically would not have the ability to set. So now, I was previously showing the kind of client side view of the application. Now we're on the server side. Our request went through the client Z-Tunnel and now it's made all the way to the server application where there's another Z-Tunnel. What happens next? Uh, there's kind of two possibilities here. We can accept traffic that is from another thing in the mesh, which is then in that MTLS tunnel that Keith talked about. Or we can accept traffic that's not from the mesh. Maybe it's from some application outside of the cluster or they're just in some namespace where they've disabled Istio. Uh, so I'll first go over the mesh traffic. So because we're on a, in a tunnel, we actually are able to use a dedicated port for all of this traffic. So even though our application is listening on port 8080, all the tunneled mesh traffic is going to this port we have reserved, 15,008. And so we don't actually need any special routing rules, IP tables, magic to get traffic there. Like it's just a normal listener in the, the network namespace uh, in the pod. Um, and so once it accepts the traffic, it's just able to terminate the MTLS, apply policies, and then forward it to the application uh, in the local pod. Now the alternative flow is that we get traffic that is uh, not from the mesh, right? And typically we just go directly to the, the port that the application is listening on and not through the Z-Tunnel. But we might want to apply telemetry on this. We might even want to block this traffic or apply more complex rules like this is allowed only to port 80 but not 90, things like that. So we actually want all the traffic to flow through Z-Tunnel even if it's not from tunnel traffic. Um, so we do this by having another dedicated port and a very similar IP tables rules to the outbound. Uh, this just says basically anything coming into the pod, we're gonna redirect to this other port. Again, we have that mark to avoid loops. And this time we also say exclude anything that is the tunnel traffic so that we don't accidentally treat that as, as plain text. Um, one pretty neat thing that we're able to do with ambient mesh that we were unable to do with sidecars is this source IP preservation. So in the sidecar model, when you got a request, it came from the Envoy that's running in the pod, right? And if you look at the source IP of that connection, you'd see a local host IP. Uh, that's not super useful, potentially, right? Oftentimes applications are looking at the source IP for logging to understand what's going on in the system or sometimes even doing authorization decisions based on uh, allow listed IP addresses, right? Uh, but we lose that with the sidecar. Um, with Z-Tunnel, we're able to uh, avoid that by basically lying about what the source is. Um, so when we open up a connection, 
to the application. We just say, hey, I actually am on localhost, but my source IP was 1234 or whatever the client IP was. And typically, uh, Linux would just look at this packet and be like, no, that's not OK. That's a lie. That's rejected. Uh, but like I said, because the tunnel's privilege, we have some neat tricks up our sleeves. Um, so there are a few socket options, uh, IP transparent, IP free bind, that basically allow this to happen. And then there's some fairly complex routing rules to make it so once uh, we do allow this packet to go out, it doesn't just get routed out of the pod and like confuse the system as where did this packet come from? I don't know anything about one, two, three, four. Uh, I won't go into those rules because they're, they're very complicated and this is a fairly short talk. Uh, but just rest assured that you will get the original source IP here. Um, again, why we're able to do this with Z-Tunnel and not with sidecars is only a matter of the privilege that we have. Uh, technically, this would work with sidecars, but it would require to give every application privilege, which is something that no one really wants to do. So kind of a recap, we've briefly mentioned this, but I want to give a bit of a deep dive into where things are actually located in terms of the client and the server side. Uh, so typically, you'd have like Z-Tunnel on both sides, but they're actually doing different things depending on what part of the traffic they're handling. So on the outbound side, we do, of course, routing, uh, as Keith talked about. We do load balancing if we're going to talk into a service and we need to decide what pod to connect to. And we collect telemetry about all the traffic flowing through the system. On the server side, we also collect telemetry, which is really useful to correlate uh, who I'm talking to and who is talking to me. Those are very, two very different things, so both are quite useful to have. Uh, and we also apply authorization policy, which I mentioned earlier, but allows us just to say things like, I only accept encrypted traffic, or I only allow uh, this specific application to talk to this application, or more complex things like that. Yep. So earlier, we talked about Z-Tunnel and how it looks at services and pods to determine where it's just in traffic to. We, we kind of skipped something there, and that's waypoints. We'd have to simplify things, but now we're ready to come around and pu pu pull this whole picture together. So if you look at this same HTTL Z-Tunnel config, uh, Z config services, um, this is very similar to what you saw before with the very important extra column added, which is waypoints. Um, both services and waypoints, um, excuse me, both services and workloads can have waypoints associated with them. And what this will do on a client side Z-Tunnel is uh, the Z-Tunnel will know to send traffic to the waypoint first if it exists for a particular service or workload. Um, this is important, again, because if you want to do uh, layer 7 authorization policy, um, where only traffic that has a certain header can be able to make it to this destination service, you've got to go through a waypoint that's going to be able to parse HTTP, HTTP, excuse me, read the headers, and be able to deny or allow the traffic based on the policy that you set. And so in the configuration that SCOD sends to Z-Tunnel, um, whether or not a service or workload has a waypoint is a part of that configuration. And like I mentioned, again, like I mentioned before, uh, the tunneling mechanism that we're using for, uh, for uh, HBone and HTTP Connect is also important for waypoints. Um, so here we see a TCP connection from a Z-Tunnel to a waypoint. Um, it's the destination there is going to be the waypoint pod IP on port 15,008. Like John said, that's sort of a port that Istio reserves. Um, things going there are going to be using this HTTP connect protocol. Um, but even though the TCP connection is going to port 15,008, the waypoint needs to be able to understand what kind of traffic is it handling, right? One waypoint could be sending to multiple different services. Um, you could be uh, sending you know, traffic to either a service or to a workload. Um, and being able to use HTTP, HTTP Connect this way, we're able to do efficient uh, connection pooling uh, between Z-Tunnels and waypoints. Um, fortunately, uh, because we're doing classic networking encapsulation, we can put whatever we want into the headers of this outer HTTP request. And in the waypoint case, uh, we use the authority header to be able to indicate what the backend service is supposed to be. Um, we can also put things for vulnerability there as well, such as um, think about your uh, tracing, whether using Jaeger, OpenTelemetry, et cetera. We can put those headers inside the, um, in, inside the headers uh, for the HTTP Connect tunnel uh, without modifying the original request. Um, and we can do this, by the way, for traffic that isn't even TCP. Um, you may wonder, you know, why can't the waypoint just read the host header that is in the original request? Right? Assuming you're using HTTP traffic, you might be able to 
open, crack open that request, see what header is there, and then waypoint forward based on that. And indeed, like, that's how original sidecar SEO worked. Um, but you know, that may work in some cases, but keep in mind that we want waypoints to work for traffic that's not even HTTP. We want to be able to work for TCP traffic. Um, we don't support UDP yet, but we'd like to get there one day to where we can tunnel anything generally via HTTP2 and connect. Um, so being able to use uh, this connect encapsulation gives us a lot of flexibility um, to add even more things later, any kind of metadata that we like um, based on the use cases that, that arise. And really, that's pretty much it. Uh, there are more details, as we said, that we could go into, but that's left the packet uh, in ambient mesh. Um, hopefully, that was, that was really helpful. And I think we've got a little bit of time. So if folks have questions, we've got a mic there in the center. Uh, feel free to step there and uh, ask what's on your mind. Yeah, and feel free to scan this QR code. I don't know where it goes, but it goes it go? to the uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you uh, for reminding me. Yeah, we've got this QR code here that will um, take you to a, a feedback survey about how you like this talk. Please let us know how we did, good or bad. We'd love to hear from you. It looks like you have one question over there. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is around the provisioning of certificates, mm -hmm. uh, specifically when you are not using SDS and using file-mounted certificates on the application part. So, like, how does it work with uh, ZTunnel? Yeah, so ZTunnel would not support that model. In the ZTunnel model, the application is kind of uninvolved from the certificate provisioning flow. Like, in the old model, uh, you know, you could read the files there because it's the sidecars there. You would use the actual application's credentials to authenticate to get a certificate normally in the non-file flow. Uh, with Ambient, it's totally different, and the Z-Tunnel is the thing that's actually authenticating to the CA to get certificates on behalf of all the workloads that it's serving. Um, so it's quite a different model. In some cases, it's, it's more secure because your actual applications don't necessarily have privileges to even get certificates. Um, so like if an application was compromised or something like that, they actually wouldn't be able to even get their own certificate. Uh, but in the case of like files, that's a, a quite a different story um, that doesn't have support today. So we'd have to kind of explore some options there for alternative uh, certificate provisioning schemes. So. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Uh, the second question I has I have was uh, around strategies around you know how do we minimize the impact uh, when the Z tunnel on the node goes down. Yeah, that's a great question. So keep in mind that um, in Kubernetes there are lots of um, you know, node level things that have a high blast radius. So you can't tear D, kubelet, et cetera. If those go down, then they're gonna impact your entire node. Um, but the re we built ZTunnel from the ground up knowing that it was going to be used uh, for node level, uh, node level proxying. Uh, and so we took, you know, very good, uh, took a lot of, put a lot of effort into making sure that we were trying to be resilient in those scenarios. So, so like what John was saying earlier, each application part sort of has a, um, a distinct uh, Z-tunnel. So from a security perspective, we feel like we're more secure in that way. Um, we're also built in Rust, which is a memory-safe language uh, for the Z-tunnel. So um, as far as CVEs or memory types of issues, we don't have uh, quite as many of those. Um, other ways to make sure that they don't uh, go down, I mean, reduce access to it? I don't know if you have any other things. Yeah, I would say I would treat it generally how I treat, how do I handle a kernel panic, yeah. which is that I, I generally don't, and accept that a node is not perfect and that it may scale down, it may crash, and then Kubernetes can help me uh, spin up pods and on different nodes, can help me have high availability, multiple replicas, things like that. Um, there's lots of things that can cause a node to go down, and we spent a huge amount of effort to make sure that we're never the cause, but if we are, then, uh, you know, there are mitigations around that. So. Great. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks. <clears throat> Next question. So you've uh, called out IP tables quite a bit in this talk. Is there any plans to support NF tables directly without going through a shim like IP tables legacy? Um, yeah, I'll answer a, a different question because I meant to say it and then I'll answer that question. <laughs> uh, one thing we get a lot is like the similar question, but oh, why don't you use eBPF? It's so much faster than IP tables. And the reason people say that is because IP tables gets a really bad rap from its use in kube proxy, whereas this very long list of IP tables rules that are constantly changing. Uh, as I showed here, we only have like a couple rules and they're static. So there's not really any performance issues from IP tables um, that can be solved with like eBPF, for example, uh, which is why we've, we're using it. It's not like we're haters of other technology. We, it just hasn't shown value. 
Um, for NF tables, on the other hand, that is something we definitely want to do. We just haven't really had the bandwidth to do it, and IP tables has kind of worked, and it's uh, quite a tricky thing to set up, to be honest. Uh, so taking on even more is, is scary, but there's definitely some people express interest. I think it's something we'll likely see uh, in 2025. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hi. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, so I'm still trying to wrap my head around with the ambient and MTLS, because I know the sidecar, now each sidecar get their own cert with their SPFI ID. But how does it work with the Z-Tunnel? So is the MTLS between Z-Tunnel and Z-Tunnel, and what is the identity that it's passed on the... Yeah, so the Z-Tunnel is going to get, let's say a Z-Tunnel is running on a node with five pods. That Z-Tunnel has five different certificates, one for each pod. And when it's proxying on behalf of a certain pod, it knows, I'm OK, now this is traffic from pod A. I'm going to use pod A's certificate. And the traffic will actually leave that pod's network namespace encrypted uh, because of the magic we showed about how we enter the, the network namespace and run in there. Uh, and then it actually communicates using the application's identity. So you'll never see, like, as the source or destination identity, like Z-Tunnel anywhere. It's always the application's identity. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. So we still get this PFID ID is the exact same type of certificate on the sidecar model. Then. Exactly, yes. yes. Okay. It's still everything really, like, there's quite a few changes, but a lot of things look very, very similar to how they work in sidecars uh, at the end of the day, just a different approach to getting there. OK, thank you very much. Thank yep. <clears throat> Let's keep it coming. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. So my question is around how do you um, do resource allocation for Z-Tunnel? So like for sidecars, today you can go very granular for applications, right? Certain applications, some applications require more resources or network, and you can have per application sidecar resources, right? With Z-Tunnel, do I have to then allocate the maximum resources uh, for the pod, which, which will then in turn, you know, Yep. Right. So we architected Z-Tunnel, again, because we knew it was going to be multi-tenant. Um, and so uh, you don't act, we built it to be very, um, very performant. And so what were those scale numbers? 200,000 pods? Yeah, it's like we, we did some tests with like 200,000 pod cluster, and Z-Tunnel is using under 500 megabytes of RAM, which obviously that's a fairly high number still, but 200,000 pods is probably 10x, uh, even fairly large cluster these right. days. Uh, whereas like sidecars in that case are using on the order of like five gigabytes of RAM as comparison. Um, so that's part of why we, we didn't talk so much about the motivations for these, but that's really why we have that split between the Z-Tunnel and the Waypoint. Yes. Uh, we're not just saying, oh, we've, we've made it like faster because we're better programmers. No, we made it faster because we made it a lot dumber. It has a lot fewer responsibilities and it's able to do those really, really well. And for the full functionality, we have that out in the Waypoint, which is really easy to scale up and down because it's just a normal deployment. You can throw an HPA on there to auto scale it even. I have multiple replicas upgraded in place without touching the application. Um, so it's really that we've made the responsibilities very, very small uh, because we know that scaling daemon sets is like a constant headache for things that uh, have high traffic, right? So we want to make sure it's as light as possible and that you don't really have to worry about that. That being said, at like super high scales or like really, really high throughput rates, like you know, serving 10 gigabits per second, video streams, things like that, you may still run into cases where you need to start looking at scaling, uh, which we have a few approaches of whether it's just scaling it up or having dedicated node pools that have large Z tunnels associated, right. et cetera. But for most users, we actually haven't seen that needed at all. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Great talk. And I would love to know if people want to get involved, if they want to participate in the project, where do you recommend they start? Yeah, I think that uh, we've got a very active Slack channel, um, sto.slack.com, and we have a lot of community members who are very passionate about helping folks um, both get their problems fixed, but also getting involved with, uh, with the project and contributing. Um, you can, uh, we've got a lot of issues and, and pull requests on GitHub. Honestly, one of the things that I've found useful in getting involved in Istio, um, I've been involved a lot, you know, shorter period of time than John has. And one of the things that I did early on was just read a few PRs. Um, that's a great way to get um, used to the code base, learn how things work. I'll also do a plug for later this week, I believe on Friday, there's going to be a contrib fest um, to help you write your first PR to the STL project. And we'd absolutely love for folks to get involved with that and find out how they can contribute and help make STL even better. Anything you want to add? No, you said it perfectly. <laughs> All right. Uh, any last questions? You got like a minute. If somebody wants to make a mad dash for the mic. <laughs> <laughs> 
we'll also we'll probably hang out. Yeah, outside. we'll be here in the hallway track as well. So uh, feel free to ask the questions then. So how do you update? I now have a, 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 a sidecar model. How do I go to uh, an, M an ambient mode without outage? Great question. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as it should be. Um, but that's something that's really on our, on our roadmap to do. Um, I could talk through, I can walk through the process uh, later of, of what you need to do in order to make that work um, smoothly. Uh, but the better answer is probably uh, check with us in about three to six months, and we'll have some more documentation comprehensively worked out. Could be three to six weeks. Could be three to six. <laughs> now that we've launched like the core, that we really like Am Eastio is a gigantic project, so trying to make every single thing applied to Ambient as well is like impossible. So we really focus on getting the core to fully stable, which we announced last week. And now that we've got that, now we're starting to like, okay, now we need to migrate people. Now that's stable, let's go work on that. Uh, so we have most of the stuff there. It's mostly just matter testing, documentation, that sort of thing. So expect that in the, the near future. It's definitely a top priority to us. We hear that often. So. Yep. I think I, we're out of time, but yep. uh, we'll meet anyone outside that wants to chat. And thank you all for coming. And like John said, Ambient is GA, so please check it out. Thank you. Yep.